the church say amen. Let the church say amen again. If you have uh, made your plans to go to heaven, say amen one more time. Amen. So you're in, the, you're in the right place, and so am I. And uh, we are grateful for the uh, opportunity to uh, continue thinking with you and wrestling with you uh, about this question that we have come from Jacksonville to pose to you and your family, and that is, is your family for sale? Well, you really can't talk about the family unless we take a serious look at the notion of technology. Amen. I know y'all brought your cell phones tonight. So if you have a cell phone, would you just hold it up? Just hold it up. Yeah, come on. I mean, we're, we're taping all this, so we got, we got some up here. We got, got some people all brave. You know, I, I don't use that thing. Okay, so now hold up your Bibles. Oh, that's wonderful. Look at that. So much better. Oh, good. Good for you. Good for you. Um, as uh, the minister here has already said, if you're visiting uh, tonight and you thought it not robbery to come out and open up your Bible, open up your heart to the Word of God, we believe you will be blessed. And I will tell you, now, if you're looking for a Christ-centered, Bible-believing, Bible-quoting church, then you need to come here. And if you find that I'm, I've lied to you, then I want you to take your family and hit the next exit, the nearest exit. But when you come, you got to come strong. You got to bring your Bible. You have to bring pen and paper and follow carefully with regard to what is being taught. Because Jesus is Lord here. And uh, we just appreciate so very much your presence with us tonight. Now that's the last nicety you're going to get from me. Okay, so I, I, thought, I thought I did real well by telling you that. So here is my first question. And I know uh, that you're going to be shocked. But uh, there is a door prize for the person who answers this question correctly. Uh, all the preachers are excluded. Elders are excluded. Preachers' wives can participate, but not preachers. Guys in the school of preaching can participate. See? Okay, so here's the question. What enterprise in America makes more money than the following Entities, Major League Baseball, the movie industry, and theme parks. I want to know what enterprise in America makes more money than all of them combined. Now, if you, if you think you know the answer, I want you to write it down on a sheet of paper because if somebody blurts it out, then you're going to miss your blessing. So write it down on a sheet of paper, and, and I'm going to ask some of these deacons uh, to get the papers, and uh, we're, going to, we're going to move forward. Anybody need the question repeated? Okay, I'll repeat it one more time. What enterprise? in America, makes more money than the following businesses or entities. Major League Baseball, the movie industry, and all of the theme parks combined. There is one organization, there's one entity that makes more money than all of these combined. Now, if, you, if you're going to participate, uh, if you just hold up your paper, and we'll ask those deacons to come by and get it, and um, then we'll see who wins my door prize. Now, I, I start my deliberation with you tonight regarding this question because this is very, very important. Um, when we talk about um, the notion of theology, we, I'm sorry, the, the, the notion of technology, 
uh, it's very, very difficult to believe that there could be a bad side to technology. But we have to be very, very careful because there are some things that have been designed and invented and created and fine-tuned that end up being a real blessing. But then as life goes forward, uh, there could be a flip side to all of that. And so that's why we want to talk tonight about the devil's theology of technology. Okay, so we almost have all the papers in, right? So once you turn your paper in, you can't change your mind. All I need is one sheet, bro. I mean, you know, I don't need you to write me a dissertation. Now. You, you wrote me a dissertation. Lord, help us all. Okay, so I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get Hiram to take a look at these since he preaches here. And if he sees anybody that wrote slot machines on your paper, you win. So who wrote slot machines? That's what I thought. <laughs> I, I, I didn't want the brother to have to suffer. Slot machines. Now, I, I know you're sitting there just like I was when I found this out. I go, slot machines, really? How can that be? Well, I want you to think about this. Your cell phone is a slot machine. Slot machines were designed and developed for one, for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to get you addicted to it. That's why it's called the one-armed bandit. That's why some people sit in front of this thing for hours on end and shove quarters in there because they believe that they will be the next millionaire. And the house always wins. I don't care if you win $250 in quarters. That's because you put $1,500 in quarters in the machine. And then people say, well, well, Brother Davis, where did you vacation? Well, I was out in Las Vegas on a family vacation. Yeah, okay. Whatever. You know. What happens in Vegas stays on the Internet forever. <laughs> See? That's what happens. It doesn't stay in Vegas. No, 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 no. So I start my conversation with you about this handheld device, and guess what? The designers, the architects of this smartphone is predicated on slot machine because they want it to be addictive to you. When Steve Jobs was interviewed, um, they said, so Mr. Jobs, what do your children think about the iPad? He said, my children don't use iPads. There are no iPads in this house. So we had people designing instruments to get you and your family addicted so that they could benefit from it. Now, without looking at your cell phone, when you get a notification on your cell phone, what color comes up? Oh, you know. Somebody tell me. You're, you're not listening to the question. When a notification comes on your phone, it is a certain color. What color is that? It's red. Now, why do you suppose they use red out of all of the colors? Because it impacts your nerves. Because it impacts your visual construct. That's why they use red. Everything that is designed into this cell phone is designed for you to keep your little grubby hands on it and not put it down. 2,600 times we touch this thing during the day. Now, if you're a high-end user, you touch your cell phone 5,400 times during the day. Did you know that there are some people who take their cell phone everywhere they go? They're in the bathroom and they have their cell phone. For what? 
I, so I might miss an important call. Well, they can leave you a message, right? There are some people who actually sleep with these things. And to my shame and embarrassment, I tell you that there are some couples in their most intimate moments have one eyeball glued to their cell phone. That's how bad this has gotten. So if you think that you're going to be the exception to the rule and that you are not going to be negatively impacted by a smartphone, you better think again. And so when I uh, talk to this about, talk with this information or share this information with our congregation a couple of years ago, I wanted them to understand that we need to disconnect to reconnect. Because if we don't, we end up having a whole society that we think technology will bring us closer together, but it doesn't. It separates us. You've been out in these restaurants where you, you see people sitting around a table and they're just laboriously working on their, on their smartphones and they're talking to the person less than 30 inches from them. And I just want to hit all of them. Why are they? Why do we do that? We can, it's so easy to get consumed with this thing. And these passages of scripture that I'm starting with tonight are saying that we will not be mastered by anything. Well, that's what's coming out of our mouths. But what about our actions? And so initially I was thinking, you know, this will be a great message for our young people. Well, no, it'll be a great message for everybody. Now, it's less than 1% of you sitting in here tonight that do not have any kind of technology on your person, and you will never have any technology on your person. Is that not correct? How many of you do not have any kind of phone or any kind of technology? There's a hand there, there's a hand here, got a real big hand back there. So there, there are people who have decided, you know what, I'll be able to live without this. Now, there are others of you, if you don't have a cell phone, then you're not going to be effective. So you know I'm not talking about that. There are some of you, if you don't have a cell phone, you will lose your job tonight. So you got to have it. So we are going to have to try to find the balance. But when you find the balance, you've got to be brutally honest with yourself. And how you use technology, or is technology using you? And so uh, the transition that I would put before you is you know your Bible just like I do. And God said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. No other gods before me. There are some of our young people that stay on this thing nine hours a day. Is there anybody other than the folks in the school of preaching that have their head in the Bible more than nine hours a day? See what I'm saying? It's, it's real easy to allow this thing to become an appendage to us. It's not an appendage to us. It is supposed to be a blessing for us. But if we're not careful, this thing can truly take over your life. The passage of scripture that was read to you a few moments ago from 2 Timothy, that this the, the, the servant of God is supposed to be able to help people who unfortunately are caught up and wrapped up in the snare of the devil. Some of us are ensnared and we don't even know we're ensnared until we can be shaken to our sensibilities, until we can actually take a hard look at what we are doing and why we are doing it as it applies to the notion of technology. And just like I told you last night, the devil is not necessarily interested in us being bad as long as he can keep us busy. Do you know that our young people across this country wake up and look at their cell phone 10 times during the night? At least 10 times. Now, what are they looking for at 2 o'clock in the morning? 
The only thing we should be doing at 2 o'clock in the morning is snoring. But they're up and they're, they're, they're looking. They're up and they're looking. And when they look at this screen at night, it turns blue. And it turns blue because this contraption wants these kids and those of us watching it, it wants to trigger something in our head to say, it's time to get up. These people have done an incredible job. Now, let me give you my first uh, uh, practical recommendation. There is a gentleman by the name of Tristan Harris. Tristan Harris used to work for Google. And he was an ethicist on their staff. And when he discovered the addictive nature of smartphones and brought it to the senior leader's attention, you know what they did about it? Nothing. And he wrote a manifesto and said, how can we do this to humanity and not tell them what we're doing? How can we be a part of something like this and not warn them? He never got any answers from senior leadership, so he quit the organization. You know he was making a bundle of money. But as far as he was concerned, there is something more important than money. And that's called integrity. And so he started his own, uh, his own foundation. And uh, you can find this at humanetechnology.com. So when you go to humanetechnology.com, he has a nine-page PDF that's called Take Control. And through these nine pages, he tells you how to make sure that your cell phone is not running your life. All of our cell phones should be set to grayscale, not to color. And the only thing that really should be on the front of our screens are things that active that you can once you hit it it takes you directly to what you need to do you don't need to have anything else on the front of your screen he said because if you do you're going to spend another 10 or 15 minutes just looking around seeing what's going on this is worth its weight in gold to me because again many people think that they're just going to run out there and I'm going to research this little piece and then I'll continue with my studies. And two hours later, we're still out there. That's by design. How many, how many of you read the newspaper? Okay, these are the smartest people in the room. Have you ever read one article on your smartphone and you were able to turn the page and go to whatever else you want to read? You can't do it. You know why? Because they have an endless stream of information. You read the article that you're interested in and something on the left or something on the right pops up and then you start looking at that. And that all of that's done by design. Because these people know that the longer you stay on this phone, the more money they make their advertisers. So if we go down this rabbit hole, and if our young people go down this rabbit hole and we don't help them to be as disciplined as they can with this smartphone. In Jacksonville, I call it a dumb phone because sometimes that thing will ring and I hadn't even done anything to it. People will call me that I've never called just like somebody did this morning at 530. Now, now if that was a real smartphone, it would say, you know, I really shouldn't call Brother Davis right now because I'm going to wake this brother up. So it's not as smart as we think. But what it does is that it is rewiring our brains. Those of you who read the newspaper, you know that your peripheral vision allows you to read the totality and the margins that you're reading is, is, is designed for you to take all of that information in and then you can move to the next article and you move to the next article and when you get to the end of your paper, you fold it over and you fold it up and you're done. You can't do that with a smartphone. You never get to the end of anything. And you also know what it's doing to our vision. That's not eight and a half by 11. 
It's forcing you, it's forcing you to take your field of vision to fit into what it wants you to fit into. So when you try to read a newspaper, it, it, it bothers you. Because you've been trained to fix your eyes into this little area. But people don't want to talk about that. I want to stay out phone. Why? What are you going to do with it? Would you give your child a loaded gun? Well, Brother Davis, don't even say that. that. That's the dumbest thing you've ever said. No, it's not. We stick a cell phone in their hand and we stick an iPad in their hand. That's even worse than a gun. Amen, lights and walls. There's all kinds of stuff out there that they do not need to see and do not need to be exposed to. But you know what? The people who designed that could care less what you think. They want our children addicted. They want us addicted. Before I left the academy, I sat with students who spent their entire weekend playing games on this thing, doing everything but their homework, and flunking out of college because, well, you know, Dr. Davis, I'm just so stressed. I said, yeah, I, I, I can tell. But this is self-induced, my brother. You're doing this to yourself. But I, I just can't help myself. I said, no, you don't want to be helped. If you have to get on the cell phone, get you one of those big bin alarm clocks and set it for 35 minutes. And when that thing goes off and shatters your eardrums, you'll stop. Give yourself some time. Wean yourself off of it so that you will be in control. But I'm telling you, this thing is, it's okay, but you better make sure that you stay out in front of it. I can make you do what I want you to do. And I can make you do what you don't want to do because I am the Lord of your life. Signed, the devil. And he will use any object, any thing, any person to take your allegiance away from the Christ. I ask um, from time to time when I go do Bible studies, I'll say, well, uh, will, will you hold up your Bible? Well, I, I got my Bible here on the phone. I said, is that your study Bible? Now, I, I know, you know, this current generation um, can do all kinds of studies and, and uh, you know, do the, the uh, concordances and the word studies and this, that. And there are some people who are very, very proficient at that. But the, but the average Christian cannot do that unless someone teaches them how to do that. And so what we're doing is we are moving farther and farther away from the page. We're moving farther and farther away from the book. I, I, I think there is an inherent danger to that. The feel of the, of the paper. And to pour over it. And to write your notes. Don't type your notes. Write your notes. I mean, study the Bible actively. Don't let people do your Bible study for you. That's why you ought to bring your own Bible. I mean, people, well, you know, uh, could you read what he just said? No, read it yourself. Now, we have a brother in our congregation who cannot read because of an organic concern. But he certainly can listen to the scripture. And he can memorize the scripture. But I'm just saying, there is a place for technology. We have to make sure that we are disciplined so that it works for us and not against us. But don't you get rid of your Bible now. Don't get rid of that. Make sure you have it and you hold it close and keep your head in there as often as you can. Because our children and our grandchildren are going to do what they see us do, not what we tell them to do. Amen? Y'all yeah, have gotten awfully quiet, so this is a fine station I'm on. Well, that's good. Um, 
Yeah, I told you about this, this strategy to keep you awake and tapping and clicking and scrolling. That's what it's all about. And if you don't think that that is addictive, you better think again. I mean, you can deliberately say, well, I'm only going to look at this one article. And the smartphone says, come on in. And while you're looking at that, if you'll notice that word that we have highlighted that you may not have ever seen before, if you click on that word, we'll give you the definition. So you click on the, you click on the word, and it gives you the definition. It gives you the word in a sentence, and the next thing you know, you've gone from five minutes to nine minutes. And then from nine minutes to 14 minutes, and then it goes on from there. Uh, let's see. The average person spends nearly two hours a day using social media. The reason why I got off of Facebook is because, uh, well, I think for two reasons. Well, the first reason was I got tired of going uh, to send a message to my friends, and there's this string of information that says, I'm going to the bathroom. I'm going shopping. I'm now at the store. And I'm thinking, if I'm a robber, if I could just find out what your name is, your first and last name, I will Google you and I will bust your house up while you're out in public. I mean, we do not, people are not thinking about what they put on this, this apparatus. We've got our children out there. We just need to be very, very careful about what we're doing. And that just got to a point where it really bothered me. And the other thing that bothered me is all of this rhetoric about uh, politics and the things that we are saying. I'm talking preachers. I'm talking elders. I'm talking teachers. People who are saying things that I just found unbelievable. And I thought, if people knew where you preached and they were able to connect your name, they might summarily dismiss Jesus because of what you said. And all of this stuff is out there, and it's unfiltered. No responsibility whatsoever. All of the stuff that I read, I'd get right down to the end of whatever it was that they said, and nobody said, I am Dr. Bill Davis. This is my cell phone number. This is where I live. If you have any issue or concern with what I've said, please let me know. Rarely, if ever, do you see that. But these jokes and all of these cruddy comments that are out there, it's ungodly and it's unholy. And somebody says, well, you're just talking about the bad side. What about the good things that can happen? I've already told you. I understand that there are good things that can occur. But if we're going to be honest, we need to take a look at everything that happens out there and make sure that we're having an informed conversation with our children and what we want them to stand for and what we want them to do. And that's why this piece needs to be folded into your family mission statement that I talked about on Sunday morning. Because if your children are clear to the end on what your family stands for and what your purpose is, then they won't be out there doing stuff like that. They won't be out there trying to find themselves when somebody's bullying them and they won't take their own life because somebody calls them fat. As a matter of fact, I'm pleasantly plump. That's how I look at it. So what are you going to do about it? See? I mean, it's people say these things and they cut our children right to the heart. Because we need to ground them in God's word. We need to tell them God does not make junk. And if people do not know you and don't call you by your name, why are you getting so caught up and worried about what they say about you? But they're dying every day. Kids sitting on railroad tracks just waiting for the train. Because of what somebody said about them. Well, let me tell you something. Back in the day, when we used to call play in the dozen, man, you had, you had to come strong or stay home. But I do not recall one person taking their own life when I was growing up because of what was said. 
Shame and guilt. I don't have the time, the, the time to talk about it tonight, but it is eating our young people alive. We've got to help them get grounded. Um, just a few more statistics, and then I'll move to my conclusion. 3.1 billion people are on social media every day. 3.1 billion people are out there saying all kinds of stuff. Some of it's good, most of it's junk. I used to ask our students, uh, where are you getting your news? On the internet. Okay. Well, what, what news organization? What? Well, I'm not speaking Chinese. I mean, what, what news organization are you following? Are you following the BBC? Or are you looking at Al Jazeera? What, what are you looking at? No, you know, the news is everywhere. All you have to do is just scroll. I said, you, you, you're trusting that everything that you're scrolling, everything that you're looking at, you think that's true? Well, of course it is. Okay, have a good day. 210 million people are estimated to suffer from Internet and social media addiction. They want to stop, but they can't. Or they don't think that they can. Uh, teenagers who spend five hours a day on their phones are two times more likely to show depressive symptoms. Well, that's a real shock. You know, the longer you stay out there, uh, the more the dirt from the world can get on you. You're not careful. And our children can be marked. They can be marked. And yet we have some parents who just throw this technology at them just to keep them quiet. Well, that's not doing a thing for them. I'll tell you what it's taken away from them. It's taking away their creativity. Give them some crayons. You, know, you give a kid a box of crayons, they go, what am I supposed to do with this? You come up with the solution. Well, there's nothing on this paper. You know, you, go, you need to come draw this. No, draw it yourself. Here's some sticks. Build something. I mean, we've, we, we have to help them with the creativity piece. It's missing in so many young people's lives. And in some of ours. Because we've become passive learners. That's not good for anybody. It's just to sit there and listen and soak this stuff in. You're not writing anything down. You know, you're not questioning where you are with all of this. We just sit there and we're supposed to, you know, just drink it all in. Well, 50% of the people driving while using smartphones are checking social media. Every day, nine, peop nine people are killed and more than 1,000 are injured as a result of smartphone use while driving. Now, half of those are in Jacksonville. You hear me? I mean, when they whiz by me, I can see them. You know, first of all, the guys are all down like that. And I don't see how they do that. But they're all down under the steering wheel. See? And then they got the cell phone up here, and they're doing 75 and a 35. And if you were to stop them, they'd say, well, I wasn't doing anything. It's just become an appendage to our hand, and we think we're supposed to look at these things with impunity. So you're sitting here tonight, and you're saying, you know, uh, Brother Davis, I see you're all worked up. You know, but nothing that you've said tonight has been applicable to me. Well, I just want to give you a short um, addiction quiz. Uh, regarding technology in your smartphone. And if you can run the gauntlet here, then you're doing pretty good. Uh, you regularly feel a compulsion to check your phone. You don't necessarily check it, but you want to check it. You know, what I do with my phone? I know none of y'all have said that. What I do with my phone? Where, honey, where's my phone? Whose phone is it? It's mine. What would you do with it? You take your phone with you everywhere you go. Everywhere you go. And proud of it. It's almost like a 
six shooter, you know. I got it. Uh, who can tell me what fubbing is? Fubbing. P-H-U-B-B-I-N-G. What does that mean? Okay, so fubbing is, let's just say a husband and wife are out to dinner. She has been waiting all week for dinner. She gets taken to Cheddar's like a great sister did with me and my wife this afternoon. Whew, boy. I had to get in a wheelbarrow to get to the car, but that's okay. Um, so you're both sitting there, and she's waiting for substantive conversation, and he whips out that cell phone. Not only before the salad gets there, but when the salad gets there, when the entree gets there, and when the dessert gets there, he's still looking on that cell phone. Or vice versa. That's called fubbing. I should charge y'all extra for that, but that's what it is. And when you, go to the, when you go to the restaurant the next time, just look around. They're everywhere. They're not interested in talking to you. They want to go, they want to see what, you know, well, what's the latest? You know, what did I miss in the last 30 seconds of life? You text or scroll through social media while driving. Now, I don't want to talk about what happens when you stop at the light. You grab your phone during any pause in your day. When you are having a conversation with someone, and you have run out of your 12,570 words in your vocabulary, then you grab your cell phone because you have nothing else to say. You spend more time on your phone than with the people in your life. Or people in your house closest to you say, you know what, you spend too much time on that phone and I'm getting tired of it. And one of these days you're going to wake up, it's going to be in the toilet. So you're going, to have to, you're going to have to start spending more time with your family. And get off that phone. Well, honey, I'm doing it for the family. I'm doing it for you. That's what I used to say. I'm doing all this for you. And my wife said, well, stop doing it for me. Now, these items can be expanded because I'm going to give you a couple of uh, book recommendations before I leave uh, that delves a whole lot deeper than this. But I just wanted to give you a flavor because many times we, we're really not honest with ourselves. You know, we think we're at one place, but we are not necessarily there. When we start evaluating and what metrics are we looking at and what kind of evidence can we bring to the table to say, no, I'm not acting this way. I'm acting this way because of this, 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 and this. So there's nothing wrong with just asking yourself. Do you have the tendency to show that you may be manifesting addictive behavior uh, with your technology? So let me uh, put a few passages of scripture in front of you and I'll give you um, some additional information to consider and uh, we will be done. I'm turning to the 119th Psalm. Uh, let's get you to look with me at verse 57, starting, please. 119th Psalm, verse 57. The record says, The Lord is my portion. I have promised to keep your words. I sought your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your word. I considered my ways and turned my feet to your testimonies. I hastened and did not delay to keep your commandments. The cords of the wicked have encircled me, but I have not forgotten your law. At midnight, I shall rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous ordinances. Not at midnight, I shall look at my cell phone to see what it says. If you're going to get up at midnight, get up at midnight to do this. I am a companion of all those who fear you, 
and of those who keep your precepts. The earth is full of your loving kindness, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. You know, when, as I continue to look back on the senior Christians that were in my life as I grew up, I remember them asking me, Bill, are you going to go home and are you going to think about what was preached this evening? Are you going to read these verses, Bill? Oh, yes, ma'am. I'm going to read them. I'm going to read every one of them. Ma'am, would you please let my arm go? I mean, they were trying to get me to understand that if I was going to fall in love with God and fall in love with his word, I was going to have to find my way to his word Amen. and develop an attentive ear. Amen. You know, we live in a day and time where if the preacher preaches for more than 30 minutes, we're done. So don't y'all come to Jacksonville because we don't preach 30 minutes. Amen. Amen. But 15 to 20 years ago, when preachers would stand up and we wouldn't move a muscle because we heard from God. And there were amens being shouted from every corner. And when those old preachers finished, and the pulpit was just smoking because it had been on fire with the word of God. People would say, are you done? Are you finished? Don't you have more? He had been up there for about an hour and a half. But now, what technology has done, it has shortened our attention span. Have y'all noticed that? We just, we, 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 just can't, we just can't sit still. You know, we, ooh, 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 let's go, go, go. God blew his horn at me earlier today. I'm at the red light. The light is red. Bump, bump. I wanted to get out and ask, are you colorblind? You know, don't you, don't you, even if you're colorblind, I mean, the light up at the top is illumined. I can't move. But people just, they just can't, they just can't wait. So as soon as the light changed, he boom, just came around me. Must have thought he was at the Daytona 500 or something. People just can't wait. We're just so impatient. Hurry up and get through, man. This is a gospel meeting. This is Monday night. I'm tired. Okay, take a number. Amen. But the God that I serve is worth it. Amen. He's worth every penny of it. Okay, let me... Um, yeah, let me give you one more. I'll close with this one. I know you know this is in the text, but it always gives me pause every time I read it. I'm turning to 1 John chapter 5. The last verse, verse 21. Little children, guard yourself from idols. Wow, what a profound statement. I know the brothers and sisters in the first century didn't have to deal with cell phones. But fast forward to where you and I live. We are still erecting altars. Either to Jehovah God or to Baal. And in many instances, that cell phone is right in the middle of everything. May God help us. As I close, I just want to um, ask the parents that are in uh, the house tonight to write uh, this website down. It's called axisaxis.org. Uh, young people that are present between the ages of 15 to 25. Uh, how, how many of you know what uh, is on TikTok? Would you raise your hand? We have a hand here. One, two, three, three hand, four hands, five. Okay, so those of you who raised your hands, how many of you have shown your parents TikTok? One hand? Stand up, bro. Yeah, God bless you for doing that. Thank you. So those of you who have been on TikTok 
and you know what's out there, is there a reason why you hadn't told your parents or shown your parents? Oh, I know I'm busy, Dr. Davis. I, I don't have time and my parents don't have a, a phone and you know, you make up all of these excuses. So the reason why I'm giving your parents <clears throat> this, email, this address is because I want you to go out there tonight and I want you to sign up for the free cultural translator. It is a, it is a, a newsletter that you'll get every two weeks, and it's free. See, I like free. But when you go out to access.org, not only will you be introduced to all of the latest slang that is being used, there are tools and resources to help you stay on top of your game. See, because young people, if you send them something via email, they will die before they read email. Because email is too slow. Email is for old people like me. But Snapchat and TikTok and there's, there, there are other names out there too. I want you to go online tonight and sign up and get educated. See? And then when your students start using some of these abbreviations around you that you never thought you would understand, you'll be able to tell them, I know you, uh, you know, I know you just told your friend I was looking over your shoulder. And yes, I'm looking over your shoulder. But you'll be able to tell them. You'll break all that stuff up. Kids are not smarter than us, are they? No, they're not. So for those of you who have given your child a cell phone, you have given them a cell phone, but it's not their cell phone. It's your cell phone. And they need to know that. I'm not saying take the cell phone back. I'm just saying, you know, I never really thought about that until Dr. Davis said it because I'm the one paying the bill on this cell phone. So it's my cell phone, which means that you can look at the cell phone anytime you get ready. And some of you are saying, oh, I couldn't do that, Brother Davis. Then I would be violating their privacy. That's why I told you whose phone it was. It's your phone. That just, that, that skips step, uh, step number two. It is your phone. Your children that sleep under the power of Jehovah in the house that you and your wife have put together, when your children sleep in that bedroom, is that their bedroom? That's where they sleep. So when they get to be teenagers, they say, this is my room. Okay, dream on. You know, I'll come in that room anytime I get ready. So let's just be straight on that. If you believe that they are mature enough and that they can handle, handle this two-headed monster, then that's a choice that you and the Heavenly Father will have to make. But I'm just saying, you should give it to them and say, you know what? I really trust you to use my cell phone. Uh, I thought that this was mine. That's what you get for thinking. See? Because I can recall this anytime you give me the reason to recall it. Oh, Daddy, you can trust me, bro. You can trust me. I said, well, that's good because anytime I look through this phone and see something that's locked down or secret that I can't review, then we're going to have a different conversation. There's nothing wrong with that, is it? I mean, we can't, we can't have our children putting us in prison and we come out when they give us permission, can we? But when parents are not serious about God and serious about his word and helping our children to be responsible for their actions, this is helping them, not hurting them. I didn't say take the cell phone back. Then... They look at us and say, well, you really didn't mean what you said. I'm just asking you to tell them, you know what? I've been enlightened. And I've been enlightened for your good and mine. Yes, you can continue to use my cell phone. Well, what if I, what if I get my own job and, 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 and make my own payments? Well, once you do that, and then you can get your own apartment and get your own car, then we can talk. Well, you ain't say nothing about it. Well, if we're going to talk personal responsibility, let's just talk about all of it. See? They'll back down. 
Um, here are two books that I, I really hope that you will purchase in the very near future. The first one is called Smartphone Sanity. Uh, it's written by Eden and Callahan, Smartphone Sanity. It is absolutely incredible and worth the purchase. The second one is called 12 Ways Your Phone is Changing You. And I really do like that one because uh, Tony talks about how our brains are being rewired by the technology in that phone. It almost drives everything that we do. And I believe that you will be blessed uh, once you get a chance to review both of those books. Now, one other piece, and then I want to extend Heaven's Invitation. And I only say this because uh, there is so much material. Those of you who are currently studying how serious this is, you know that this area is growing exponentially. What we talk about today will be outdated tomorrow. But I want to close this morning by mentioning, and I, this evening rather, and I really appreciate your kind attention. I know people don't like to slog through stuff like this. But let me tell you, if your child has ever been negatively impacted by the junk that goes on out there, you know this stuff is important. If they have ever come to you saying that they've been bullied or somebody's hurt their feelings, you know I'm not making this stuff up. But just in the, in the material that I've put together, I have found five pathologies that emerge by people who do not use their cell phone responsibly. And the first pathology that I will mention to you is passive ignorance. Passive ignorance. It's, it's the ignorance that is physically related to the phone. I'll give you one example. People who suffer from passive ignorance do not understand why their thumbs and their neck always hurts. Because they don't know what position to put their thumbs in, and they don't know what position to put their neck in. Man, I got this crook in my neck, and I just can't understand it. Well, I know you can't understand it. It's just like I told you about the eyes. Something is happening to our eyes when we spend an inordinate amount of time on this cell phone. And the research is continuing to come in. Secondly, not only do we deal with passive ignorance, but there's also passive innocence. There are some children who want to get out there so bad because their friends are out there. And then they get out there and they start talking. My address is 1256 Lakeland Avenue. Y'all come see me. They say all kinds of things, and unfortunately, there may be consequences to what they've said, but they don't, they don't know. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to say because they haven't been trained appropriately. Then there's active participation. See, These are the people who are intentionally engaged out there, whether it's honorable or dishonorable. They mean to be online, they mean to say what they say, and they're going to say it because they know there's a firewall and nobody can find them. Number four, there is active belligerence. These are the people who troll looking for somebody to talk about or to put down or to hurt their feelings. And they also introduce secret apps to their friends and they know that their parents have told them I do not want you going to these sites because it may infect the phone, it may infect your mind. I don't want you doing that. Well, there are dirty people who just want to push that on others who are not strong enough to say no. And then finally there is active damaging. See, if a person becomes addicted to drugs or alcohol or pornography, they don't want to celebrate that by themselves. They want to pull somebody else in with them. And here you are, cute little Christian girl, you know, debonair Christian boy, you will be the major target because you want to belong. You want to be accepted. And the next thing you know, 
you've put yourself in a position of compromise, and if you're not close to your mother or father, you will perpetuate that lie until God exposes it. And so I just close tonight by telling you I know what the devil's theology is. I know that he wants to hurt me, and I know that he wants to hurt my family. I know he wants to tear up the church. He doesn't care how he does it. And here is a tool that could be a blessing in your ministry and mine if we are disciplined with it. But if we're not, we're going to end up being in trouble. I appreciate your kind attention this evening. I am, I'm under great um, conviction about what I've shared. Because again, we, many of us have our head in the sand. Oh, it's not that bad, Brother Davis. I mean, come on, man. You act like the sky is falling. The sky is already falling. And our children may be wrapped up in something that they should not be wrapped up in. I just pray to God that they will find someone that they can disclose what's going on in their lives so that we can help them. If you're here tonight and you don't share our religious conviction, we want you to know that we are members of the Church of Christ. The church that Jesus purchased with his own blood. And we are going to look for strategies. We're going to look for avenues to keep our eyes on the prize. And we're going to hold on. And we're not going to let the cell phone. We're, go we're not going to allow the addictive nature that's already built into the cell phone to allow that to remove Jesus from the throne of our lives. Are we? Well, then you do yourself a favor, as I've done mine. You go back and take a look at the 168 hours that we are entrusted with during the week. Find out how much time you're spending with the Lord. Find out how much time you're spending in his word. And how are we going to improve this so that we can model appropriate behavior before our children? Those of you who are visiting, these are the kinds of conversations that we like to have. We do not want to be ignorant of the devil's schemes because he's got them. You hear me? And he will use any scheme possible to get you off of the glory land way. But it takes courage, as I've been saying, to be a Christian. You've got to be brave to be a Christian. You have to be able to look at yourself and say, you know, I really don't like where I am right now. I'm grateful that my friend invited me tonight. I kind of like the guy who's been talking because he's been talking about these things from a biblical perspective. Never really thought about that. I may want to get in on this. How do I become a Christian? Well, I'm so glad you asked because it starts with hearing. Romans chapter 10 at verse 17. We must not only be brave enough to hear, but we need to believe what we've heard. Hebrews chapter 11 at verse 6. To then repent of our sin, Luke chapter 13 at verse 3. To confess the sweetest name that has ever been uttered, Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. And then allow our body to be buried in water for the forgiveness of our sin, Acts chapter 2 at verse 38, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Colossians chapter 2, read the whole chapter to do you good. There's water in the plant. Aren't you grateful for that? Because when you are immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sin, you come up out of that water to walk in newness of life. That attitude that you had before you were baptized stays in the water. The attitude where you used to think that you were the best thing since sliced bread stays in the water. Amen? <laughs> then, we are able to walk the king's highway. Revelation chapter 2 at verse 10. We can be faithful until death. But y'all know who this message has been for? This message has been for those of us who are on the wall and we are watching for Jesus' sake. We just have to watch a little closer. Because that evil one will snatch our children even while we're watching. He will come up into our homes. Come into our televisions. And any kind of way he can get to our kids, he'll do it. And many times we allow him. But we've got to be on point. 
you got to watch my back and I've got to watch yours. And we should not be ashamed or embarrassed to go to our brother and sister and say, you know, I know you have these wonderful children, but can I ask you, how much screen time are they getting? Well, that ain't none of your business. Well, I thought we were brothers and sisters. Well, you just crossed the line. You don't ask me about my children because I'll go upside your... I, I'll see you at church on Sunday. Okay. okay. Boy, you know, I guess there's some things you don't, you just don't talk about. But again, when I grew up, everybody in that church had free wing on me. Come here, boy. Yes, ma'am. Look up at me when I'm talking to you. Yes, ma'am. You want me to tell your mama? You're going to tell her anyway. So I should. Would y'all please pray for me before I get beat to death in the church? Now, if you say anything to anybody's church, somebody's little face just, it's amazing. What, you think your kids have a halo over their head? They don't. All of our children need to be trained. Now, I'm not saying go up to some of these kids and put your hands on them. See, that's dumb. But if you see something going on, you ought to say something. And don't get out there in the street. Yeah, I knew them. I knew them kids down there at South Florida Avenue. You should have seen them throwing them song books around like they wasn't trained. Did you say something to them? No. Why not? Because cause, cause they ain't my children. Well, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? If you're not going to be a part of the solution, keep your mouth shut. See, that, that, that's why we have problems in the church. We're not giving folk enough work to do. People who are busy are not talking. I know y'all didn't know that because I'm talking about the church in Jacksonville. <laughs> I just ask you to look at your life as I have looked at mine. I've already asked God to forgive me. You hear me? Nobody's pointing fingers at anybody in here because I need Jesus just like you. But I'm not ashamed to confess his name. Are you? Then you come to him while together we stand and sing. I am his son.